Okay. Now, I would like to discuss the first step of the GW calculation, that is the generation of the uh, wave function file, including empty states. Uh, this is the set of variables that are needed. So the idea is that, first of all, you perform a ground state self-consistent calculation with the only occupied states plus some empty states just to, uh, let's say, make the uh, SCF cycle more and more stable. And after this step, you get the density file. And from the density file, you know, in Conishan theory, you can construct the Hamiltonian, the Conishan Hamiltonian, and you can compute the eigenstates and the uh, eigenvalues of these Hamiltonian, including high energy states that are needed uh, to build the polarizability of the self energy. So the first line specifies the density file produced by the SCF cycle. This is just an option that tells Sabinity that we want to compute Konishan eigenvalues non self consistently. Uh, this is the total the stopping a criterion on the residuals of the wave function. This is the number of states um, that we want to compute. Uh, this example is for silicon, and obviously in silicon, you usually have four occupied states, but here we ask for more states because we need to uh, compute the returns of the sum over bands. This is a very important point, this parameter and the buff, because the NSCF cycle will stop when uh, all the states are converged within this uh, stopping criterion. The problem is that high energy states uh, require a lot of iterations converge within the uh, stopping criterion. So with NBD buff, essentially what, what we are saying is that we don't want to check the stopping criterion for the last 120 bands. This corresponds to 10% of the initial number of states. So we are excluding the last states when we check for the, the stopping criterion, and we can save a lot of uh, uh, CPU time because many applications of the Hamiltonian in the NSCF iteration are just uh, needed to uh, converge the high energy states that are uh, unstable. So I will suggest to let's say, use a very large number, usually 10% of N-band to avoid problems in, when uh, diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, when uh, computing the eigenstates for the, the GW calculation. Um, the example I showed previously uh, used the iterative techniques uh, to apply the Konechama Hamiltonian. And uh, for large system, uh, what we usually do, uh, we use the para KGB option mm -hmm. that corresponds to an optimized eigenvalue solver that is parallelized over K points, band, and FFT. Now, here I have some tricks or some suggestions for the input parameters, but the main message is that. Uh, if you use para KGB1, you have an eigenvalue solver that is more scalable than the default one. And if you use out parallel one, then adding it will automatically select all the input variables related to the eigenvalue solver uh, at, at runtime. So I strongly recommend using these two options in the generation of the wave function file. Uh, then I would like. Two questions. Uh, first, regarding this buffer that you said, the first 120 you will compute and then uh, extrapolate to. Uh, no, no. How is it this sort of stochastic measure? No, no, no. There's no stochastic measure. Essentially, what we're seeing. So, this is the end band. So here we have 100, 1,200 states, and this is 10 percent NBD buff. When we compute the residual, that is uh, in K, so the residual is defined by this equation. This quantity is always positive, is equal to zero if and only if psi and k is an exact state of the middle. And when the stopping criterion, we take the maximum over. 
n and k of the residual. Okay. And this quantity should be smaller than all the five. Is 10 in order of eight minus 18. And to the, yes, this is the typical value that we use for uh, for the residual. Mm -hmm. for the, but the stopping here is the maximum of n and k of the residuals okay. should be smaller than the far that in my example is 10 to the minus 18. Okay, but the maximum is done over all the bands and over all the reports. Now, what happens is that these are the high energy states, and the residual is usually peak. So that after uh, I don't know and 20 NSCF iterations, tall WFR for the low energy state will be already of the order of 10 to the minus 20. Mm -hmm. And here is that uh, some of 10 to the minus eight after 20 iterations. And you have to spend a lot of other, other iterations to bring this value down below 10 to the minus 18. So you are spending a lot of uh, resources. And with the buffer, and with the buff, you tell me, please, when you bring these states when you take the maximum over bands. So the maximum is essentially done from one up to, and then the minus, and be the buff. So you're just taking the maximum in this region, and you're excluding the last states, and 10%. Does it make sense? Yeah. Uh, okay, this is a, a new feature that is available in Abinit version 10. Uh, in a nutshell, you don't use it these iterative eigenvalue solvers in which you have to apply the Hamiltonian many times. You just build the Hamiltonian in Fourier space and then you use a scala pack to perform a direct diagonalization. And this is way more efficient uh, when you have to compute uh, a lot of states uh, and also has that much better scalability. And this is a benchmark for uh, zinc oxide that converts the whole time needed by direct diagonalization versus uh, iterative eigenvalue solver. So this is what I would recommend for your GW calculation when a minute 10 will be released. <clears throat> I think it was already available at version six. But not with yeah. Calabac. Not with Calabac. Uh, okay, in the next slides, I would like to discuss the computation of the RPA polarizability for the space. So this is the full polarizability, the reducible polarizability according to Edens, where we have the, the vertex gamma. Now, as you know, in GW, gamma is replaced by a product of two delta functions. So in uh, GW, Polarization is simply given by GG, and this corresponds to the RPA expression. Uh, so this is what you get in uh, if you work in real space in frequency domain. In, in the time domain, it's just a product of two Green's function. <laughs> By the convolution theory theorem, if you go to frequency space, you have to evaluate this convolution between two Green's function. If you use the lemma representation for G and you do the convolution and you can obtain an analytic expression and it gives you this uh, denominator. And we did the lemma representation in real space and in the frequency domain where view is the critical potential. And then we have this uh, complex shift theta that is called the bad cut, named the Z cut in, 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 in those values reported. This is needed to avoid the, the poles on the on the on the real axis. <laughs> uh, now, if we express the Adler-Weiser expression in a, a real space in the frequency domain along the real axis, we obtain this expression here. But in a bit, as I mentioned, we work in Fourier space, so this means that we have to transform these two spatial variables to uh, the Fourier in residual space. And uh, after some math, what we obtain is the following expression here. As I mentioned, uh, all these are our, all our quantities are now are given in terms of uh, a big matrix that depends on two plane wave indices, a wave vector Q in the first period zone, and the frequency. 
Now, the number of plane waves in the polarizability is specified by the KTPS. These are the dimension of the energy. stands for the amount of energy, for epsilon, for uh, and the dielectric matrix. Here we have a sum over uh, K points over the full brilliant zone, and these K points cannot be changed at will. They depend on the K points used to generate the wave function file with the again values and the Konechham um, orbitals. Here we have a sum over conduction and balance. We are assuming a system with a gap. Uh, the number of uh, let's say empty states that you want to include can be changed at this level in the input file by just playing with the n band, but clearly. The number of bands cannot be greater than the number of states that are already available in the wave function file. Uh, then, okay, if you want to uh, sample uh, the polarizability, then there are other uh, variables defining the linear mesh along the real axis, or you can also sample along the imaginary axis. And these L metric elements are essentially the metric elements of a plane wave between two Monisham states. And these terms are computed with a fast Fourier transform. Instead of using uh, this expression here in Fourier space directly, that requires the evaluation of uh, a convolution. And then the mesh for the FFT, for the M metric elements, is defined by FFT, FFT GW. As I mentioned to you, when you have a product in real space, then in Fourier space, the cutoff energy is four times the cutoff energy for the wave function. So that there are options that allows you to select an, F an FFT mesh that is large enough to treat this convolution or an FFT box that is smaller and that is more efficient, but also introduces some numerical noise. Um, this is an example of a typical input file for a screening calculation. First of all, we read the weather wave function file using this variable here, and this is the string defining the path to the external file. Opto driver three activates the computation of the polarizability. This is the cutoff energy defined, defining the number of plane waves in chi, and this is the number of bands in the RPA expression. Uh, perhaps other things that is worth mentioning here. As I told you, uh, the reports are, are tuned for plasma pole approximations. In this case, you need to compute the polarizability at one or two frequencies. So by default, if you don't change the, the standard behavior, I will need to compute the polarizability at another uh, point along the imaginary axis. And uh, PPM frec defines the, this frequency along the imaginary axis, and by default is set to the true plasma frequency that depends on the number of the balance electrons you have and uh, the unit cell volume. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, plasma pole frequency is uh, the dielectric. Uh, it's somehow we had a discussion with uh, Francesco that there is a peak in polarizability that this uh, PPM uh, actually is going to be that number. <clears throat> How do you define this uh, PPM, the frequency in, uh, in dealing with? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, my question is that how you you usually select this frequency mm -hmm. in the PPM method? Okay, because I still have to uh, discuss the plasma pole approximation yeah. and how it works. But <clears throat> in this case, the idea is to move to compute the polarizability uh, along the imaginary axis. Yeah. Okay, not the, along the real axis. Uh, just because you want to have a model that can be generalized to the complex plane and you want to reproduce some ab initial results, you move along the imaginary axis because the polarizability is smooth. So, so your fit is more stable. Yeah. So this is not the real plasma frequency that is along the real axis. Hmm? But you don't want to move along the real axis because you're going to have uh, a lot of uh, oscillations. Okay, so according to our test, using uh, this second point for the plasma pole fit, let's call it like this, and set it to the root plasma frequency is a, a, a good idea because you still have something that has a structure but is, let's say, not too high in frequency, and so the fit is numerically stable. Okay. 
Uh, another point that I would like to mention is that at the level of the quasi particle gap or quasi particle energies, there's a cross convergence in the sense that the results depend on a number of plane waves that you introduce in the polarizability as well as the number of bands. The reason is that if you go to a large G, these large G components are very sensitive to the contribution given by high energy states. So this means that you cannot simply perform a one-dimensional conversion study, but you have to increase the number of empty states and the cutoff energy at the, at the same time as shown here, because obviously if you fix one parameter, for instance, in KTPS, and then you move, uh, you increase and bend, then you find the converged value here. If you move along the the other axis, obviously, we find another value here. But as you can see, the most reliable uh, approach would be to converge both in band and the KTPX. And this is the kind of convergence value that you should get at the end. Another point that I would like to mention also that we found that this kind of uh, cross convergence uh, studying can be done at relatively small. Uh, uh, K-point sampling. So you can start with the gamma or 222, perform this kind of uh, analysis to find the optimal value of the band and the KTPS, and then you start to increase the K-point sampling. Uh, okay, very briefly, as I mentioned, uh, the code is able to exploit symmetries for the wave functions, and the similar trick can be used for the polarizability of the self-energy. So the uh, the polarizability is a full invariant if we rotate uh, both arguments, spatial arguments, and uh, uh, here we have the spatial rotation, the fractional translation. If you start from this equation and you go to Fourier space, then you get a relation from the polarizability at point RQ and the polarizability at point Q. This is the expression that we use to reduce everything to the IBZ. So in other words, we don't need to compute the polarizability for all the Q points. We just consider the Q points in the IBZ, and then we use this kind of symmetry properties uh, to reconstruct everything in the full period zone when we need. Uh, okay, so these are the equations required to compute the discrete interaction from the polarizability. Uh, this expression can be equivalently rewritten in terms of uh, the inverse kinetic matrix that is given by this expression in matrix notation. So the idea essentially is to, once you have the polarizability chi, you build the dielectric matrix epsilon, but we need to invert this matrix. And uh, this is done, uh, let's say, in uh, the Fourier space, uh, frequency domain. Mm -hmm. And once we have the inverse dielectric matrix, this is the quantity that we store uh, in an external file. So here we are inside of driver three, the calculation of the polarizability that ends with uh, this step, this matrix inversion, and then the results are printed to file. Uh, another point that I would like to mention is that in semiconductors, the head and the wings, the head refer to the zero zero component and the wings refer to the G zero or the zero G component. They tend to zero in the long wavelength limit. When we compute epsilon, we have to multiply chi tilde by the Bird Coulomb interaction. So, in principle, we have an ill defined form, zero over zero form. But this expression is finite in the long wavelength limit. Uh, the problem is that, from the point of view of the implementation, we have to compute the limit of these matrix elements from so Q10 into zero. And if you do some algebra, you can express mm -hmm. the elements of the position operator that I defined when you enforce periodic boundary condition. You can express this operator in terms of the commutator between the Kwanishan and Miston and the position operator. So now there's a lot of algebra involved, but the main result is that these matrix elements can be expressed in terms of the commutator of, of the Amistonian. And the, uh, yeah, since we are using the potentials, there's an additional term coming from the non-local part of the pseudo. This part is expensive, but it's very important, especially if you are interested in optical properties, you have a few points, one isotropic system. 
Uh, and you will see that a similar uh, input variable is also used in DP and the EXE for the, for the beta sub beta. So by default, we always compute uh, this additional term. Uh, if you want to disable it, then you set include BTB to, to zero, the calculation are faster, but obviously you introduce uh, an approximation. Uh, in this slide, uh, I'm essentially mentioning uh, that if you want to compute the polarizability for several frequencies, then there's um, another technique uh, whose computational hot does not scale with the number of frequencies that you want to compute. This is the so-called uh, Hilbert transform, and is mentioned in this uh, uh, tutorial. And this technique is applied to a similar uh, method implemented in angry BASP. This is what I would recommend if you want to go beyond the plasmon pole. So we've been seeing in the plasmon pole, one frequency or two frequencies are enough to compute self-energy. If you want to evaluate the convolution numerically, you have to compute the polarizability for several frequencies. And in this case, I would suggest to the build the Hilbert transform method. Uh, okay, this is a, an example, but you, you will find a similar input file also in the, in the tutorial. And now I would like to discuss the computation of uh, the GW self energy and the quasi particle uh, quasi particle corrections. So this is it is self energy in the vertex, and we are like gamma is equal to two delta functions, and this is the GW expression. Uh, okay, we have already seen the physical interpretation of the self energy, uh, and in particular uh, the Dyson equation that connects the Konechan mean field real function G naught to the fully interacting uh, G. Now we never construct G or sigma um, explicitly as a function of R, R prime and omega, but what we do. We solve the so called quasi particle equation, in which we have the first term that is essentially the RT Hamiltonian plus this integral in which sigma acts as a kernel. And, but I would like to mention that here the self energy must be evaluated at the quasi particle energy. So this is not a standard uh, eigenvalue problem. This is a non linear eigenvalue problem because our unknown quasi particle energy appears on both terms of this equation. The quasi-particle energies may, might be complex. So the real part is the position of the spectral function. The imaginary part gives you the lifetime of the uh, excitation due to electron-electron interaction. Now, if we compare the quasi-particle equation written here with the Konechan one, obviously the first two terms are R3, uh, plus external potential. The main difference is essentially that in Konechan we have a VXC. Right? In the quasi particle, we have this integral in which C max as a kernel. So, from this perspective, we can see VXC as a, a static and a local approximation to the self energy. Mm -hmm. But we have already solved this problem at the Konechan level. So, this means that we can reuse this information to try to solve in a perturbative way the quasi-particle problem. Now, the main assumption is that we assume that the quasi-particle amplitudes of the quasi-particle orbitals are equal to the Konechan. Mm -hmm. And uh, under this assumption, if after some uh, math, what you get is that the quasi-particle energy, the solution of this problem here, can be written as Konechan plus correction term. But again, this correction term contains the quasi-particle energy inside the self-energy. So this is a, a nonlinear problem. In principle, we can solve it, provided that we know the frequency dependence of the self-energy along the real axis. But this is expensive. And usually, the quasi-particle energies can be seen as a small correction to the Konechan. It depends on the system. But in the, let's say, simple SP materials, usually the corrections are relatively small. So this suggests to expand the self-energy using a Taylor expansion around the Konechan. So we assume that the, the correction is small. So we expand the self-energy here using this standard Taylor expansion. Uh, and we introduce also the so-called renormalization factor that depends on the derivative of the self-energy with respect to omega. And under this assumption, the so-called linearized quasi-particle, 
we obtain that the quasi particle energy is equal to the Kahn's sham plus this term here, which the self energy is mm -hmm. about at the Kahn's sham level, and we know the Kahn's sham energy, so we don't have to solve the uh, linear and uh, the self consistent uh, quasi particle energy. And the, uh, this term here then gets multiplied by the renormalization, the renormalization factor. And if you do the math, what you realize is that this Z is essentially the area uh, uh, associated to the quasi particle peak. So this means that if G is, uh, is greater than 0.7 or is around one, means that you have a well defined uh, quasi particle peak. A value of G smaller than 0 0.7 means that there's some additional structure due to the satellite because as you know, the spectral function integrates to uh, G1. Uh, now, how do we compute the self energy? Okay, as I mentioned, uh, the, in, in the time domain is just a product of G and W. In the frequency domain, we have this convolution. Now, uh, we split the spin interaction in two terms by just, uh, let's say, adding and removing the per Coulomb term. Uh, so the W can be written as a uh, first term that is just, just the per Coulomb interaction that is long range. Plus what we call WC, the screen part of W, that is a short range that comes from this uh, inverse electric matrix minus one. And uh, if you use this, uh, the composition of W with the self energy, and you do the math, uh, you can compute the convolution uh, uh, introduced by V, easy, and this gives you the FOC operator. We call it the sigma X, the exchange part, that is a static and emission. And then we have the correlated part that is frequency dependent and non emissions. Uh, now, another important point that I would like to mention is that we never compute the self energy in real space or as a function of GG prime. We computed the matrix elements of the self energy in the corner sham by the set. And if we address it in one shot, we can solve the, quasi the linearized quasi particle equation. We don't need the, all the of diagonal terms. We can just focus on the diagonal parts and only for the states around the, uh, the gap. And it is the typical output uh, that we obtain at the end of the calculation, which we have the key point for the, thing, the self energy here. And then, okay, the spin index, the Gorishan gap, quasi particle. And these columns are essentially the matrix elements of uh, the DC, the change part, the correlation part, the correlated the correlation energy, the renormalization factor, and then you have the, the quasi particle correction, the difference between the GW and the correlation. As concerns the selection of the key points, you can select them explicitly in terms of uh, these three variables. So then you find now the number of key points, key points that you want to including the computation of sigma and then the list of events, or you can let a bit decide automatically these parameters. And usually we set QB range to zero because we are mainly interested in the correction of the fundamental and the optical gap. So this is very handy if you don't want to specify all these parameters manually, they would be fine. Um, <clears throat> as concerns the computation of the exchange path, uh, we have that sigma x is simply given by g times t. And if you do the math, what you get is the FOC operator. The main difference is that is the FOC operator computed with Kameshan wave functions. And if you express all these terms in Fourier space, this is what we get. And we, we have a sum over five states, two points in the full brilliant zone, and another sum over a g, that we, and the number of g's is controlled by this variable. Now, uh, this is the Bell Coulomb interaction, converges slowly in G space. Uh, and uh, one has to be careful because there's also a divergence when Q is uh, equal to zero. And there are different techniques uh, that you can use to accelerate the convergence with respect to the key point sampling. And here, uh, everything is documented uh, on the Abinit website. But anyway, the, the main idea is that. Uh, you have an integrable singularity when Q is tending to zero. 
So you want to remove a function. Uh, this function has the same divergence as the Bernoulli function, but is uh, integrable. So numerically, we have to uh, evaluate the self-energy in which part of the divergence uh, has been removed. The pool of divergence for Q tending to zero has been removed thanks to this uh, function uh, that is uh, discussed in the, this paper here. This is the default behavior, but it's not necessarily the most, uh, let's say, the most efficient one. Because we found that one can also compute the uh, integrals of the Coulomb interaction with the Monte Carlo techniques. And this usually leads to a much faster convergence uh, with respect to the number of points that I'm not seeing here, but okay, this is the number of uh, uh, key points uh, in the or Q points, and it's in the evaluation of the, the fork operator. So by default, okay, we use this method here. If for production, we usually activate the Monte Carlo technique, but everything is explained in the in documentation. Uh, this is the expression for the correlated part. Uh, okay, I don't know if you have, um, you have realized that in the, the fork operator, we only saw over occupied states. So the, the exchange part is the, at the GLAB level is way faster than the correlated part because in the correlated part, we have again the sum over Q points in the full period zone, a double sum of plane wave indices that end very here and here and matrix elements. Uh, and this uh, um, num the number of plane waves is defined by the cutoff in the following probability. And mm -hmm. most importantly, in the correlated part, we have to sum over an infinite principal infinite number of states, and the convergence is, is very small. It is very slow, sorry. Uh, now, the problem is that this term here is frequency dependent, and the frequency dependence comes from this integral here. I'm not going to report because it's really a nightmare. There are a lot of terms. But the main point is that a lot of uh, several techniques <laughs> have been designed in order to evaluate this integral as a function of omega as fast as possible and with the reasonable uh, accuracy. And there are, let's say, two techniques that are commonly used in this uh, field. The first one is a plasma pole model that is an approximation, but is fast and usually works nicely for states around the gap. And the other techniques rely on a numerical integration of the convolution. But in this case, we need the polarizability as a function of omega, both along the real axis and the imaginary axis. So they are much, much way more expensive than the plasma pole, but they are also more uh, accurate. So now I'm going to discuss in more detail this plasma pole stuff. I think it's important and there are advantages and drawbacks. So the idea is to model the frequency dependence of epsilon minus one. We have a model that allows us to obtain epsilon minus one everywhere along the real axis. So in the plasma pole, what we assume is that the imaginary part of epsilon minus one is essentially a delta peak uh, located at the, the, the plasma resonance. Okay, this omega g1, g2 on q because we are working in a, in a crystalline system, so our flower can depend on two plane wave indices and uh, every vector, and this is the strength the plasma resonance. Once you have this model, you can use Kramer's chronic causal relation to obtain the real part from the imaginary part. And this is the model that we have. So if we assume that the imaginary part can be modeled with a single peak, then these are the parameters for the real part. But how do we obtain these parameters? So A, omega, and the big omega. The omega field is just a function of this A and omega. So in order to obtain these parameters, we fit ab initio results. So we try to reproduce ab initio results uh, as close as possible. And okay, I, I'm gonna skip these two models. I'm, I'm mainly focusing on uh, these two techniques. Uh, this one is the plasma <laughs> pole by log units. That is the default model. In this case, we reproduce, we, we obtain these parameters in order to reproduce the ab initio values uh, for the static limit and for epsilon minus one along the imaginary axis. Okay, we, we don't move along the real axis because we are going to have oscillations. The fit is not going to be stable. 
So this is also of analytic contamination. Okay. In this case, we need to compute uh, the polarizability at two frequencies. And then there's another technique, method, proposed by Abels and Louis. Unfortunately, I don't have the reference, but you will find it uh, in the Abel's website, in which we the parameters are fitted in order to reproduce the static limit and the F-sample. Okay, uh, this is the default. And this is what we would recommend. As a rule of thumb, the second plasma ball tends to overestimate, to, to, to give results that are slightly larger than the first plasma ball. Uh, again, uh, this is an approximation, usually works well for states around the gap, but there are also some products that you should be aware of. So first of all, this is the typical error. When I say error, if we compare the results with the more expensive uh, numerical integration, the self energy, this is the typical error that we should expect for simple SP materials. If you have DOF and the whole metallic system, I would not recommend, uh, say, the plasma board. But again, it's a very nice tool for initial convergence studies, uh, and it's very efficient uh, both in terms of the CPU and memory. But here there are drawbacks that I've already mentioned. So for DOF electrons, I, I would recommend the condo deformation. <laughs> Most importantly, <clears throat> you cannot have access to the, uh, the spectral function because you only have uh, a delta peak, so you cannot study, let's say, um, other lines. Uh, and okay, this is a figure that shows uh, the real part of the self energy in aluminum calculated with and without plasma ball. This is the Fermi level. And as you can see, the, the plasma ball leads to a physical uh, oscillation metallic system. Mm -hmm. uh, typical input file for uh, self energy calculation with the plasma ball. Uh, in these two lines, we specify the path to the wave function file and the screening file. Uh, containing the, the static limit and another point on uh, the imaginary axis. This is the cutoff for uh, epsilon when we build the self energy. This is the cutoff for the exchange part. The number of bands that we are going to uh, include in the computation of the correlated part of the self energy. And this section here specifies the key points and the bands for the uh, fuzzy particle correction or for the Metric elements of the, the self energy. So in this case, we are just computing uh, the correction for one K point, gamma, for band two, three, and, and two, four. Any question? Uh, very quickly, if you want to go beyond the plasma ball, <clears throat> this means that you have to compute the convolution between the G and W along the real axis. And in principle, this integral is from zero up to infinity. So you have to sample many frequencies. And the problem is that both G and W, they have poles along the, the real axis. So you need a very uh, uh, good res high resolution in, the, in frequency space, and the numerical integration uh, is tricky. So that's the reason why we avoid this integral from zero to infinity, and we use basic results of complex calculus, uh, Cauchy theorem, to rewrite the integral along the real axis in terms of uh, an integral along this contour in which we have to sample uh, uh, G and W along the imaginary axis. And uh, in this case, uh, the integral function is smooth because we are far from the poles that are located uh, along the real axis. And then uh, we have an additional term that comes from um, the residuals of the integrand inside the uh, contour. But we know the position of this pose because we know the position of the G thanks to the, the, the Lehmann's representation. Okay. To make a long story short, instead of sampling everything from zero up to infinity, we only need to sample uh, computer screen interaction uh, along the imaginary axis, uh, the, the positive uh, branch. And we need to compute the, uh, the polarizability only for a restricted set of uh, frequencies uh, along the real axis, but we don't have to go up to uh, infinity, okay? And give is essentially the expression that you get for the correlated <laughs> of the self-energy. In terms of an integral over the imaginary axis, 
and integrals coming from the poles inside this contour. But the poles are only limited to a finite frequency range. You don't have to go up to infinity when sampling the, the screen interaction. And these are the three parameters that allows you to select the frequency mesh in the polarization along the real axis. Okay, well, if you use the contour deformation method, then you can also obtain um, <clears throat> the, um, the spectral function. By default, this calculation is deactivated because it's expensive. But if you want to do contour deformation plus spectral function, then you select the number of points in the input file, by default is zero, and also the maximum frequency along the real axis. And this is what you should get. So, uh, from a minute, I think this was a result for silicon dioxide or something or second from uh, reference aluminium. Okay, all the results are stored in a text file here, and then you can plot it with MATLAB or Plot or any other tool. And as you can see here, we have the quasi particle plus some satellite. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, the code supports both norm conserving and the PW. Uh, although I would recommend non conserving pseudo potentials for your applications, but even if, if you use non conserving pseudos, there are a couple of technical points that um, uh, are worth mentioning. Because a pseudo potential is essentially mimicking the interaction seen by the valence electrons due to the core electrons that are frozen and the, the, the nucleus. Um, the, the pseudo potential is uh, built in order to reproduce um, the wave functions at, uh, outside a certain core radius and the uh, eigenvalues of the, the energies in the isolated atom. We use pseudo potentials because the wave functions are uh, smoother. We get rid of the Coulomb um, uh, singularity the, the, uh, around the, the, um, due to the interaction with the nucleus. So we need the less flame waves to describe the interaction. We also get rid of uh, our electrons. So we have less uh, electrons uh, that should be solved self consistently. The problem is that the pseudo potentials. Um, cannot reproduce the nodal shape of the wave functions around the origin. The fact that the wave functions have oscillations in terms of the true interaction. And moreover, uh, core electrons are frozen. So they do not relax, relax self-consistently, okay? When we perform a calculation for uh, a, a crystalline system. These are very well known uh, problems, limitation for Konesham and ground state theory. The problem is even worse when you go beyond Konesham, and in particular because we have the, the focal operator, the change part. Uh, because the, the focal operator depends on the atomic orbitals. And when we take metric elements, the nodal shape of the wave function is important in order to have uh, accurate results. And in order to have accurate results, we should uh, include in our pseudo the electrons that are supposed to give the most important contribution to the focal operator. Now, this is an example for gallium, in which you can have different electronic configuration, what we call the core balance partitioning. I mean, you can have a version that contains uh, the 3D electrons, then 4S and the 4P. This is shown here. These are the 3D states. And then we have 4S uh, in the, the, the black curve. And then the 4P is the red curve. Uh, the, the dashed one is the uh, pseudized uh, wave function. And the solid line is the all electron. As you can see, the pseudized one is nodeless, whereas the all electron has uh, two, one, one, two, two, two nodes here. Now, in this conf and this is this figure here shows also the logarithmic uh, derivative that is a proxy for the scattering properties uh, of the pseudo potential, in the sense that the pseudo potential should be able to reproduce the scattering properties of the whole electron atom. So, if the solid line here uh, is reproduced by the dashed line that corresponds to the pseudo. We are confident that our pseudo potential is able to describe the scattering with electrons 
at this region here. The negative energy corresponds to bound states and the positive energy corresponds to unbound states. The foreground state application is very important to have a solid and rash lines that are on top of each other in, in this region. So if I look at this plot, what I see is that uh, this pseudo potential has good scattering property for occupied states, but it fails to reproduce the, sc the scattering properties of the whole electron atom at high energy state. And this is important for GW application. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, the 3S and 3P states are not included in the pseudo potential. Now, it's very well known that this uh, configuration is okay for ground state. And if you want to do structural relaxation, uh, band structure, molecular dynamics, this pseudo potential is perfectly fine. But this is not what I would recommend for GW calculations. And the reason is seen here, in which I have another pseudo, in which now the 3S and 3P electrons are treated as valence. And you see these states here. So this soil, this red dash the line corresponds to the P, and the black curve is the 3S state. And as you can see, the 3S and 3P overlap with the, the 3D electrons. So this means that if you have um, a system in which the 3D electrons participate to the CPM or the, the VPM, then if you use this pseudo potential, the 3S and the 3P electrons will be included in the FOC operator in, in your uh, self energy calculation. And the matrix elements of sigma x will see this uh, overlap. Mm -hmm. If on the other end, you use the <laughs> potential, <laughs> these 3D electrons won't see the exchange with the 3S and the 3P simply because these electrons are frozen in the, the pseudo potential. So, and this can have a huge impact on the matrix elements of the exchange part. And the last but not least, if you compare the logarithmic derivative obtained with the by including 3S and 3P in the in balance, you see that now this, uh, the pseudo potential, uh, let's say, is able to reproduce the scattering properties of the whole electron atom up to, let's say, 7 EP, whereas in other pseudo potential starts to fail at uh, 5 up, uh, sorry, the state energy is in the artery. So this pseudo, let's say, is supposed to give more accurate and reliable results in the GW, uh, in GW calculation, also because we can really go high in energy without uh, having the spurious effect, what we call ghost states. Uh, okay, so this is also the reason why for GW calculation, I would recommend to use the pseudo potentials provided by the pseudo dojo project available at this URL, in which we have a pseudo for non conserving PW, three different. Uh, uh, exchange correlation functionals. Uh, we have pseudo potential for uh, scalar relativistic uh, or fully relativistic pseudo potentials with the spin orbit uh, coupling. And we provide two tables. The standard one is designed for ground state application. And in this case, for instance, you will find the, what I call gallium D, gallium with just the 3D electrons in this standard table. But we also have a stringent table that has more valence electrons, uh, smaller core radii, that is designed for highly accurate ground state calculation or anybody, which we want to have good scattering properties in the energy region, and also semi core states to account for this uh, overlap in the focal generator. And all these um, pseudos have been uh, validated by uh, computing uh, equation of state for elemental solids and then comparing with the uh, electron results. And we performed some convergence study with respect to the cutoff mm -hmm. energy. And on the basis of these um, uh, convergence studies, then we provide the hints for uh, the uh, initial cutoff energy for the wave functions that uh, you can use to start your convergence studies. Uh, OK, last two slides related to the GW bond structure. First of all, we call it one, once you have the density, you can uh, perform a band structure calculation along uh, an arbitrary path. Mm -hmm. In um, GW, or even in rt hybrids, this is not possible. Mm -hmm. You cannot obtain quasi-particle energy at, any, uh, at arbitrary k-points. You can only compute corrections for the k-points that are included in the wave function file 
that you use to construct a Green's function. Mm -hmm. And this is a mesh, it's not a path. So you can only have finite, let's say, set of quasi-particle energies in the blue zone, mm -hmm. and you cannot have then structure fault. If you want to have then structure fault, then you have to resort to some kind of uh, incorporation. There are different methods. In the simplest case, you just fit the quasi-particle correction as a function of energy. This is very crude, uh, uh, but relatively easy to implement the technique. You can use it just at the beginning to have some idea, but I would not recommend it doing that. Mm -hmm. You can use a body interpolation, not going into detail, but uh, everything is explained in this uh, article here. Uh, it's very accurate. The problem is that you rely on uh, maximally localized body function, and there are systems in which obtaining uh, maximally localized body function uh, is not trivial. And another approach. It's based on the star function interpolation. Uh, I don't know if you have ever used Volstrap code, but anyway, you take advantage of some symmetry properties of the energies in K-space to perform a disk square fit uh, while preserving this, uh, these symmetries. So you don't need any kind of uh, linearization. Although uh, you can have problems in the presence of a uh, bandit crossing. But anyway, just to show you Let's say that the main idea and how to automate this uh, the calculations. Uh, this is a, a Python uh, script. Uh, it, mm, these objects are implemented in uh, ABPI. Uh, we have an NCDF file produced by Abinit with the self energy corrections computed for all the key points in the uh, irreducible brilliant zone. We read this file, okay. And then instead of interpolating the quasi-particle corrections, uh, we interpolate the, uh, sorry, instead of interpolating the quasi-particle energies, we interpolate the quasi-particle corrections, the difference between quasi-particle and quasi-particle. That's the reason why we also read another file uh, produced by the, the Konishan part, GSR stands for ground state. Once we have these two objects, uh, so the Konishan bands and quasi-particle energies, then we just call this function here that takes care of performing this star function interpolation. And then we just call this a plot method. And here we have this figure that shows the LDA band structure and the interpolated uh, results for the quasi-particle uh, band energies for, uh, for silicon. And I think, yes, my last slide, and I thank you for the attention. Why this uh, counter deformation technique can uh, give the uh, satellite feature? Why this counter deformation technique can provide uh, us with uh, these uh, satellite features and they are absent in the, the Z method? Uh, wait, yeah. the plasma pole method, I would say. You can uh, define Z uh, also in the counter deformation. No, no, no. The, the, the method to solve the uh, quasi particle equation. There is a, a Newton expansion, Taylor expansion yes. that you use, and then you have a Z as a weight mm -hmm. uh, of quasi-particle uh, uh, can block. But you said that in contour, actually, using contour deformation technique, yeah, yeah, you are able to capture those satellite effects as well. Ah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, which are absent in the solution using this uh, Taylor expansion. Ah, yeah, because uh, uh, Z and the quasi-particle energy gives you the peak. Uh, yeah. If the, the Z is small, since the, the, the spectral function integrates to one, this means that the spectral weight has been redshifted. It's shifted that. So you should see some additional structure here that gives some contribution to the integral. In many cases, you have this uh, satellite that corresponds to an interaction with other oscillation plasma. And, Function with the plasma, but in order to see the satellites, you have to compute the spectral function. Yeah, because uh, when we solve the quasi-particle equation with the delinearized method, essentially we are working here. Uh, okay, small. Mm -hmm. uh, Indeed, the Z gives you the area area is to the peak. Uh huh. It's a local description. Uh, but once you apply counter deformation. Uh, is it related to this uh, that uh, we 
have some residual effect uh, or not. What do you mean with the residual? Once you consider this uh, contour, you had a slide there, right? There are a few poles of, uh, okay, yeah, those green crosses that uh, you will compute uh, the frequency dependence. You have integral over image axis and in, uh, contribution coming from poles inside the contour. Yes. So is it related to that, this uh, satellite feature? Oh, great question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's uh, asking whether the satellite feature is related to the... Uh, related to the technique that we are dealing no. with, uh, self-energy. If your question is, uh, the, if the numerical integration of the convolution is done properly, you should see the same results uh, independently of uh, the deformation of brute force uh, sampling from zero up to infinity or analytic modulation. So it doesn't the idea is to uh, reduce the number of frequency points needed to converge the convolution as much as possible. So this is the main idea of the quantum deformation. The radar codes Berkeley GW. Berkeley GW. Yeah. Berkeley GW integrates from zero up to infinity. Yeah. But then you have oscillations. And here, the idea is to, okay, you have oscillations, but you only need to compute the residuals in this region. And another important contribution to the integral is given by the imaginary part that is much easier to converge. Yeah. And again, as I mentioned, these residuals have unlimited in, uh, in frequency. Uh, there's a certain omega max, you know, uh, beyond which I mean, you don't have uh, uh, contributions. Down. So this means that you don't have to <laughs> sample from zero up to infinity. Uh? Yeah. You can stop, I don't know, here <laughs> in the calculation of the probability. Mm -hmm. So usually this requires less frequencies than a brute force integration. But if the two methods are converged, then you should get the same spectral function. Do you use a uniform sampling of the frequencies or some algorithm? Along with the imaginary axis, there is a Gauss Lagrange. And uh, along with the real axis, is a linear mesh. Because indeed you have um, a cutoff here, and then uh, uh, the number of points you want to sample. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question also about the uh, quasi particle wave functions. So we saw how we can calculate the quasi particle energies, but how do we calculate the quasi particle wave function? <laughs> <It's tricky. laughs> I should have a couple of slides. This is related to the so-called quasi particles of consistency. Because you know, you, have, you can have uh, one shot in W, then energy only, that is perhaps the simplest kind of self-consistency you may want to try. In which you just update the eigenvalues. Then you decide if you want to update in W only, in G, in the self energy. If, uh, if you um, say, suppose that the quasi particle wave functions differ from Konesham, then you should do some kind of self consistency in which you have to diagonalize the self energy. Because the, the self energy is not going to be diagonal, this Konesham representation. So that's, the reason why I was saying that the off-diagonal matrix elements are needed if you want to go beyond one shot. For one shot, you just compute the diagonal terms. And, uh, okay. Now, the problem is that self-energy is not Hermitian. So if you try to diagonalize it, a lot of, there are a lot of numerical instabilities. So that's the reason why people started to uh, suggest uh, approaches in which you construct a static and Hermitian approximation to the self-energy. Mm -hmm. Effective Hamiltonian in terms of the GW self-energy. And in this paper here, for instance, they compute self-energy and then you take the off-diagonal matrix elements between the two Konesham states, then you have to deal with the frequency dependence. So there is that you compute that epsilon i, epsilon j, and you take the average. And this allows you to define an effective Hamiltonian. Okay? And then you diagonalize this operator. 
This allows you to compute new quasi particles with functions, so you have a new density, new R3, and then you iterate again. And this new with function in principle used to recompute the lemma representation for the polarizabilities. And uh, yeah, it's really memorable from this paper. Yeah, so you know, one shot tends to overestimate the exp experimental values. <laughs> because the consistency, you overshoot. Uh, but it improves. The problem is that it's more expensive. Uh, than, uh, than one shot. And then there are also other effects uh, related to the thing. Uh, we have been working also on electron phonon interaction. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to do Thank you. What types of vertex corrections? Can you reflect vertex corrections? What is implemented in the opinion? So we have a vertex correction in. Uh, W but uh, DVDFT like the thing that Francesco already introduced, yeah. so a kind of best W, W tilde, which includes uh, a vertex but in a TDFT like, so with a, an exchange correlation kernel of TDFT. So it's, let's say, an historical way, but I mean, it's not uh, so far, uh, there are no clear. Uh, Proof that is improving everywhere. Mm -hmm. But we can also compute the electron phonon interaction. Uh -huh. yeah. Because I mean, uh, you also have the interaction with phonons that tends to reduce the pen gap. So, since including the vertex, so the performance and kind of self consistency usually overshoots. Uh, our idea is that one should also include the electron phonon interaction to. Have these additional effects, <laughs> and, but also because this gives you the temperature dependence. Until yeah. <laughs> you uh, compute the uh, variables uh, for the phonon corrections? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is there a constraint for using the W in the two D materials or slab? You mean like uh, what? Is there, a cost? is there some, can we use it uh, in a material that has a large vacuum as a vacuum? Uh, yes, as you know, plane waves uh, do not yeah. play well with vacuum, yes. but yes, uh, we also implement cut, uh, cut off in the Coulomb interaction. I mean, it's very well known that you have this interaction within periodically repeated images. That's the reason why you have to converge your calculation with respect to the vacuum. And uh, it's true in Konesham, it's even worse in uh, GW mm -hmm. because you have no local operators that are more sensitive you know, to this, this interaction. So the idea is essentially to cut, is to cut the Coulomb term. Uh, if you have a uh, two-dimensional material, you want to have uh, an interaction that is untruncated along X and Y, but you, you cut it along Z. Mm -hmm. And so we have different uh, cutoff mm -hmm. techniques. That you can use at the, the GW level. Again, it's just to accelerate the convergence with respect to the vacuum. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, here, here for the zinc oxide, I think so, but you're missing vertex corrections for sigma. Or... Um, this is a GW electron. Is a calculation in which he has include the vertex in W yeah. in the, with the BASP. The, this calculation comes from BASP, and then we renormalize it by including the, the correction due to the electron phonon. Okay. Yeah. As you can see, essentially, the electron phonon interaction allows one to decrease the gap uh, and bring it in a better agreement with the experiment. And, uh, yeah. This calculation are even more demanding than GW, uh, the electron phone. You are talking about this GWEH? Yeah, GWEH. GWEH. GWH. It's electron or Electron only in the, yeah, it means a vertex correction in W to account for electron only interaction. Oh. And then on top of this GW electron then we take into account the electron phone and self energy. Mm -hmm. Because GW is only, well, it is equation are formulated at clamp ions. Mm -hmm. 
And that one, you have to go beyond to take into account that uh, ions are moving and then uh, you have zero point uh, and accumulation and, and temperature effects because these temperature effects when you start to accumulate forms, not electrons. But as long as your gap is larger than KT, electronic degrees of freedom are, are not affected by the forms. Seems that the zero point motion always uh, closes the gap while uh, uh, there are two terms the, uh, the fan, the big dark term. No? If I remember, that opposes one uh, to the other. Mm -hmm. And so, if it, if it is one of the, of the two, should be a positive correction to the fan gap. While in soil, here I see all this uh, negative correction. Mm -hmm. This is on top of, uh, of the square. No? And the big down the bi-wall and the bi-wall and the bi-wall and so on. They cancel the acoustic limit. They cancel each other in the acoustic limit. They cancel each other? They cancel each other in the acoustic limit. Okay, but let's say they are opposite inside, no? So not in the acoustic limit, you should respect the acoustic limit. They cannot be opposite because they cancel each other. For other frequencies, why? It's clear to me that they cancel well. They must have one. They cancel each other, then you should not have a correction to the observable motion, to the gap. Yeah, yeah. 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 But then they are opposite. And so in one case, it could be that the, the bi-waller is larger than the fan field up. There can be also some things that uh, it's the other way on. So, yeah. Then it's a question I always ask it to people uh, doing uh, this electron phone calculation. Mm -hmm. And they told me, no, there should be some system in which uh, you have an opening of the gap. But yes. so far, I have not seen. Uh, no, no, you, you can have it. Uh, you so can have it. The majority when it tends to shrink, uh, okay. that system is in which you have this opening, okay. the phosphorus. 